My name is Siobhan Vivian. Thank you to Kate and everyone at Creative Mornings for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, as Kate mentioned in her lovely introduction, I am a full-time author, which means it is a real treat to have a reason to take a shower in the morning and change out of my pajamas into normal clothes for you. So thank you for coming. Um, this is my three plus novels uh, that are out currently, but I do want to clarify one thing which Kate did mention, but I want to put a little emphasis on. I am not just an author. I am a young adult novelist, and I hope you can hear the pride in my voice when I say that. Simply put, that means I write books for teenagers about teenagers. Now, what else designates a young adult novel as a young adult novel? Well, nine times out of 10, that means the protagonist is a teenager, and that teenager exists in the moment of their youth. Plenty of adult novels have teen protagonists also, but they tend to be older characters retelling the things that happen to them as teenagers with the benefit of some distance and wisdom and reflection. The other thing you should know about me is that I have a serious professional chip on my shoulder. I wish that this weren't the case, but when I say that I write young adult novels, people often roll their eyes at me, or they ask me if I would ever consider writing a book for grown-ups one day, or they'll say some patronizing thing like, wow, you can really make a living doing that? And then when I imply that, oh yes, I make a very nice living doing that, they temper their shock, and let's face it, jealousy, with the notion that I am a commercial hack, a sellout. They assume that my books, or young adult books in general, aren't sophisticated, aren't literary, they're not nuanced or original, each one is a derivative of the next that they maybe take like a week, maybe two, if you're busy with other stuff to write. Um, basically, they think I write books like this. And maybe you do too. I mean, look, I love these books, but maybe you do too. Maybe you think that I write Sweet Valley High, especially if it's been a while since you read a young adult novel or if the last one that you picked up happens to be one of these four beauties, um, and you're judging an entire genre of literature on a deliciously trashy vampire love story. But please trust me when I say that young adult is one of the most exciting places and diverse places to be writing stories for. And uh, my specialty, which is realistic fiction, is enjoying a particular boon right now. Um, so Publishers Weekly, which is sort of the most respected trade magazine within the publishing industry, reported that over half of the buyers for young adult literature were outside of that target age range of 13 to 18 years old, and 78% of that over the half were purchasing those books for themselves. Why? Well, the reality is that we are in the midst of a golden age of youth literature. Never before have works of such quality and diversity and controversy been published to such a wide acclaim and to a wide audience. And the line now that differentiates a young adult novel from an adult novel is become more about marketing and commercial positioning than it is a reflection of the quality of prose. And there are no limits and taboos in terms of content of what you can write about when you're writing for teens. Last year, in fact, um, a young adult novel was named Time Magazine's best novel of the year. And that's like best out of all adult, you know, and otherwise. So, like, we nailed it. Um, 
and plenty of respected adult authors have crossed over to writing young adult, and it's not just because of the paycheck. Um, Salman Rushdie, Neil Gaiman, John Grisham, Sherman Alexie, Gillian Flynn, Nick Hornby, who has this lovely quote um, when he was writing about young adult novels in The Believer. Um, and I recently read a review of a young adult novel by New York Times bestselling author Jamie Attenberg, and she said, I would recommend this book to practically everyone except for the people who describe themselves as book snobs because there's just no saving them from themselves. So if you're hiding from young adult lit, you're missing out because these books are awesome. Topic achieved. <laughs> I'm kidding, I have a lot more to say <laughs> about Sweet Valley High. Um, so, I hear my kid laughing, that's funny. Um, okay, so back to Sweet Valley High, which got a big old laugh. Um, I think that part of the judginess that comes um, like with young adult lit and looking down at young adult lit comes from the way that we as adults have marginalized our own teen experiences as silly or corny or dumb. And we've forgotten what it was really like to be a teenager and that the feelings we felt back then were visceral and raw and real. And in the abstract, high school can become this kind of cliche fest of the good girl versus the bad girl, and the cheesy romance, and the popular kids versus the nerds, and bullying as a buzzword. And like, those things are all things, but they don't really carry any weight or mean anything. Um, and it's true that young adult lit does explore and hang on these tropes of high school that we have all been through, like falling in love for the first time, or realizing that the world isn't always just and fair, or figuring out the kinds of people that we want to be. These experiences can seem trite to us as adults, but they were formative when we were teenagers, and those experiences are the things that shaped you into the person that you are today. So um, this is basically my favorite quote ever about writing from Stephen King. Um, I'll leave it up there and you can just kind of peruse it and zone out while I continue talking. But it's basically about finding stories and that um, it works perfectly with the theme of today. There are stories hidden all around us and my job as a writer is to find them. But what I look for even more than just a good story is a good truth. To write successfully for teens or for anyone, you need to unearth a truth. Because a truth is the thing that can transform that universal into something unique. The generic into the specific. A story told a thousand times into a story and a character and an experience that feels new and fresh and interesting. Following the path to discovering these truths is the journey that every writer goes on when starting a new project. And most of the time, we don't even know what we're looking for until we start to uncover it. And that is part of the magic. So to that end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my creative process and how I found that truth for one of my most recent novels called The List. So um, The List, is far and away the most successful book that I've written. Um, it's in, currently in its eighth printing and it got to spend an extra year in hardcover. Typically a book comes out in hardcover for a year and then follows up paperback immediately after that year. But I got to spend two years in hardcover because it was continuing to sell so well. Um, it's been published all over the world. I'm actually a freaking bestseller in France. So <laughs> let's move to France, Nick. Um, and as Kate said, it has recently been optioned for MTV by Stephen Chbotsky, who is the writer and director and former Pittsburgher behind Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, so as a writer, I love writing stories about real girls and real problems. And I'm always looking for inspiration, both within my own experiences as a teen and kind of what's going on out there in the world. So it was back in 2009 that I came across this as I was sipping my morning coffee. 
So this was an article I saw on Good Morning America. There was also a, um, like a video thing on Good Morning America about it. But this is basically a story about a high school in New Jersey that's not very far from where I grew up. And it's talking about a tradition that this particular school has. Uh, it's gone on for years and years and years. And it's uh, where a secret group of senior girls makes a list targeting the incoming freshman girls. Now this list, and you could read this in the articles and, and on the, the TV little bit that they did, but this list had gone on for about 15 years of a tradition and without really anybody at the school stepping in, teachers kind of like knowing that it happens but not really dealing with it. Um, but then this year, somebody leaked the list to the media and like all of these newspapers and Good Morning America and all these uh, news organizations swarmed on this high school and put microphones in the, the girls' faces and wanted to talk about, you know, this tradition. And it was a big story. And the school was humiliated and the principal was suddenly being held accountable. Why is this going on? He is trying so hard to put a stop to it, but there is this like impenetrable cone of silence around the girls who made the list and no one will give it up. No one will say who did it. And they're all protecting these girls. So like I'm drinking coffee and I'm reading this and I'm like, that's something. Okay. Let me dig a little deeper. So I started to follow this story and it lasted a couple days. Um, this is another article that happened in a local paper um, that was reporting on it as well. Now, this article talks a little bit about the specific things that were written on this list. Things like, I have my friends practice giving head on me because I'm a man. Um, keeping up with the family tradition, bend me over and knock me up. Things like that. So, as you can see, this list is more sexual in nature. And it's important to note that the things that these senior girls were writing about were completely made up. Um, some of the digs that are mentioned in this article obviously are more on the cruel side, but I read other articles where it posted the whole list and some were like not so mean. Um, they were almost f weirdly flattering in that weird way that like bitch can somehow be a term of endearment between girls sometimes. So I'm, I'm reading this and I'm like, okay, there's something interesting there. Obviously, there's no, it's no surprise to anybody in this room that teenage girls can be terrible <laughs> to each other. But again, that's me and that's a comment kind of on the surface. That's not really digging deep. We all laugh at that because we know. Everybody knows that's part of everybody's experience. But then as I started to scroll down in the articles, literally going deeper, um, I started to notice that the actual girls from the high school were flooding these articles and making comments on the, um, you know, in the newspaper and, and kind of having a dialogue about what the list meant to them. So I swept a little dirt away, to use my fossil um, analogy, and read how some girls were happy that finally people are talking about this idiotic tradition and maybe they'll put a stop to it. And then a little lower, I found that some girls were like, oh, it's no big deal. Everybody's making a big fuss about nothing. And then I saw a comment that basically made me like grab a freaking shovel and start digging. So this is a Milburn cheerleader. And she is talking about her um, reaction to the list. Now, this particular student says a few contradictory things, like on one hand she says that the list is stupid and that everyone knows that the things that were written on it aren't true. But then she also says that a few of her friends were mentioned on the list, I'm assuming in that kind of kindly way I was talking about earlier, and now they're all super popular. But the thing that got me really thinking was this one line, uh, quote, I know a lot of girls were upset because they weren't on the list. And that to me showed a real power that the judgment of a group of anonymous people could hold so much sway and that some girls were so desperate to be seen at all that to be singled out in any context um, was something to aspire to. So I had already written uh, in a previous book about 
the kind of unfair judgments that I feel like teenage girls face in terms of exploring their sexuality. And, um, but I still wanted to write about this. I still felt like there was something interesting there. And when I thought about it a bit more, I noticed that this particular list, though billed as a slut list, um, you know, you could almost see the girls through the things that were written about them. Pretty girls, likely had the kinder things written about them and it was like the ugly girls who had the real visceral mean things written about them. So basically what I have now is a skeleton and here's something I want to explore. It's time for me to put meat on those bones. So when I reach this point in my brainstorming, I try to find something relatable in my own life um, as an emotional underpinning to jump off from. Um, and for that, I actually didn't have to dig very deeply. So this is a picture from my high school yearbook. This is our homecoming king and queen. You'll probably notice that our homecoming queen is a very typically beautiful, smiley, sparkly girl. And that our homecoming king is, let's say, a bit of a non-traditional choice. This boy um, was the kind of kid who got picked on a lot. He was overweight, he was goofy, awkward, and he bore the brunt of some pretty merciless teasing for the three years prior to senior year in our high school. And that year, a really weird thing happened. So I'm not sure where it started actually, but suddenly there was this groundswell of like, let's get this guy nominated for homecoming king. And I think for some people, it was a something of an apology maybe, or like a reward for surviving, like being treated like a piece of garbage for, for three years. And then I think for other people, it was just a way to further the joke about this guy. And in the beginning, I remember it did make this kid a little uncomfortable to suddenly have the focus on him and being like, yeah, come on, dude, you're gonna be homecoming king. It's gonna be amazing. But then, like after that kind of initial shock and the target wore off, then he really wanted it. He really, really, really wanted it in a way that made me just feel like ugh, cringy. Um, and it was like as if he felt that like getting that label could somehow overwrite the last three years of what happened to him in high school. And I had always wanted to write about this kind of situation because it definitely stuck out in my mind as something I remembered about high school and something kind of, anytime I get that feeling, that ugh, feeling, like I, that's where I want to go. Um, so I took this guy and I basically Frankensteined him with that list that we saw earlier and I made up a, a, a story about a girl who I called Jennifer and basically Jennifer is going to go through something similar with the list involved. So for the last three years of high school she has been picked as the ugliest girl in her class. Freshman year, sophomore year, junior year and now it's senior year and she gets picked again. And then there's this like weird groundswell thing that happens similar to this where they're gonna elect this girl homecoming queen. So I pitched this, this was my idea. This is what I wanna write about. So I pitched it to my editor and uh, he's a great editor. His name is David Levithan. He's also a writer. Um, he wrote Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, which was a movie and a bunch of other novels that are amazing. And he's, he's an editor, but he's also a writer. So whenever I pitch to him, it's always dangerous because he's going to come at me with some kind of amazing brainstorm. And he had one that made me like spit out my Diet Coke. He said to me, well, what about the other seven girls on this list? You know, what's their story? And then suddenly my very small book about one character became a lot bigger. I didn't need just one skeleton. I needed to find eight skeletons. <laughs> so, um, so the premise for my book became this. At a high school that I call Mount Washington, they have an annual tradition. Every year on the Monday before homecoming week, an anonymous list hangs, gets hung up all over school. Copies are stapled to the bulletin board, taped to the locker doors, hung on bathroom mirrors. On this list are the names of eight girls, uh, those deemed to be the prettiest and the ugliest in each grade. 
And then the book follows those eight girls for a week in their lives as they handle, you know, issues of self-esteem that come with being on the list. And then also the disconnect that sometimes happens um, between the way we are perceived and the way we perceive ourselves. So this is page three in the book, and this is my list, my eight girls, kind of taking a little bit of a uh, cue from the list that we saw in the GMA article with a little kind of note underneath. So um, uh, my prettiest freshman is Abby Warner. Bonus points for overcoming family genetics. So that's kind of like taking from that other list where they said, you know, like in a family tradition, you know, bend me over. Um, but the challenge was this now. To make these eight girls real, I needed to go beyond the story of our homecoming king. And to be fair, that was a very safe way for me emotionally to write this story. I knew I had to go deeper, and I knew I had to start digging within myself. So, this is another yearbook shot. Can you find me in the <laughs> picture? Um, this was Wear Blue Day. And uh, pep rally. I'm there with like my big old chunky shoes and sitting in, you know, with the volleyball team. Um, so I was accepted in high school, but I was also very much an outcast as well. Here is the odd couple, um, senior superlatives. Odd couple was the nice way of saying freaks. And this is me with uh, a known burnout who always smelled like kitty litter, weirdly enough. But I'm like enjoying it. He's a little more on the fence, but I'm like, yeah, most unique. Um, so I could give you the superficial surface level story and I could tell you the, the story of the girl who was too cool for her New Jersey high school. And it's the story you probably already know. The one maybe you, fellow artistic kindred spirit, lived yourself. Um, but it wouldn't be the whole truth and it wouldn't be my truth. The bleached hair and the thrift store clothes, the red sweater on Wear Blue Day, all of it was me, but it was also my armor. Um, it was my way of saying, hey, guess what, Rutherford High School, I already know that I don't fit into your idea of what is pretty or what is cool, so I'm going to go so far off in the other direction that you don't even think that I'm trying to play your game, and then that's where it is. But of course, the truth was that I did want to have people think that I was pretty. I did want to have people think that I was cool, um, that there was something special about me. That was behind everything that I was doing. And when I finally started to unpack that and come to terms with that, um, it opened me up to so many memories of high school that I had just locked in a jar and put deep down inside and never thought about because it didn't fit that like very glossy story that I like to tell people about the kind of girl that I used to be. So this stuff was different <laughs> that I was getting to. And I was in the middle, for example, I'm going to tell you a horrible story about myself right now. Um, so I'm in the middle of writing a scene about that girl, Jennifer, who is ugly four years in a row. And the, the groundswell has already begun in terms of getting her elected homecoming queen. And I'm sitting down writing this story about her. She's at a party. And I start writing this thing that happened to me and I, I did not remember it and it just came out and afterward I was like, oh my god, that sucked. But here's what happened. So I'm at a party, it's freshman year. It was like one of the first parties where there was like ample amounts of booze, not just like a little booze that was stolen, like somebody's dad or brother came through in a big way and there was like booze to be had. And I'm coming there with my, you know, version of the girl you're seeing up there on the screen. My school was pretty small, but we were right in the shadow of New York. I knew all these kids from, um, you know, kindergarten. So you have your, like, personality pretty much on a lock by then. And I'm at this party, and this boy who I have known since kindergarten is flirting with me. His name was <clears throat> Chris. I'm not going to say the last name because this goes up online. So Chris was like flirting with me and 
I was thinking to myself like, huh, that's a surprise, you know, does my hair look like extra good today? What is this luck that I'm having? And, you know, we're having the party, whatever, and we're playing a game and then we need beer and the beer is down in the basement. So I volunteer to go get the beer in the basement and lo and behold, who is following me downstairs but Chris. And we stop, we don't get the beer. Instead, we start making out on the washing machine. It's so hot. And I'm like, I can't believe Chris, I can't believe Chris, can we edit that out? Chris is making out with me right now. This is killer. And I'm really enjoying myself. And then I guess like upstairs, people are like, where's the beer? So somebody opens the door and this like wedge of light finds us and then the door closes. And then the door opens up again and I hear the kid whose party it is, this guy Joe, at the top of the stairs, scream to the rest of the party, oh my God, Chris must be drunk. He's making out with Siobhan. I am like mid-French, <laughs> tongue out of my mouth. Chris laughs in my mouth. He does like a <laughs> and so meanwhile, I'm writing this and I'm like <laughs> crying, remembering this horrible thing that happened to me. He laughs. I think he still like continued to make out with me and I would like continue in the shock of making out with him. But then I was like, what am I going to do? I can't walk up back upstairs. This is humiliating because I'm hearing everyone laughing upstairs. Ha ha ha. And so I'm like, okay. And I know he heard it too. So he was like, not, you know, suddenly our makeup was way less hot. And so he went upstairs and I like went out the side door and went home. And then, like I said, I locked that memory in a jar, never to think of it until this moment when I'm in the scene and writing. And as much as it hurt me to like type that out and access that moment, um, because I had gone to such great lengths to hide it, from myself even, um, I knew also that I had gotten somewhere really good, really interesting for the book. So um, you might have known this book, uh, it's called The Chocolate War, and it's a wonderful book, in a, and it very, very accurately captures the struggles of peer pressure and male culture on adolescent guys. To me, the war that girls are facing today is the pressure to be considered beautiful. And again, our adult selves can sort of shrug this off. We can say that high school doesn't matter. You guys, you're so beautiful. Don't worry, the people you're trying to impress right now are such losers and they'll never amount to anything and you'll grow up and you'll be so strong and brave and smart and beautiful and like, forget these idiots. But if you think that this is something that teenage girls can laugh off or, I don't know, channel some of that self-confidence and just deal. If you think that it doesn't really matter what peers think of you at this age, then you don't remember anything about high school. And even when you didn't care, you cared. You so cared. I'm calling you out. You so cared. And this, sadly, is how much teens care today. Am I pretty or am I ugly? I was screwing around on the internet um, when I should have been working, and I typed this into YouTube, and this is what comes up. Hey guys, I just wanted to see how many of you think that I'm either pretty or ugly. Now, this has been viewed five million times, and she has 52,000 dislikes and 17,000 likes. Am I ugly or am I beautiful? Be honest, please. People tell me I'm ugly, but others say I'm beautiful. I just wanted to ask if I am pretty or ugly. Please tell me, comment, please, I need to know. Leave me a comment saying if I'm pretty or ugly, thanks. I have watched so many of these videos, it's, heartbreaking. And every girl who posts a video like this articulates to me the same struggle, which is that some people say I'm pretty and I don't trust them. And some people say I'm ugly and that's more likely. Which am I? Stranger? Person who doesn't know that I'm a good sister? 
or a, a kind daughter, or really good at science. Like, doesn't matter. You're reduced to a like or a dislike. These girls are all looking for a definitive answer, one that should dictate to them who they are and how they should feel about themselves. And yet each one is an individual. So going back to that metaphor, it's a, this is a story that these girls are all going through. And yet these, just a glimpse of the girls I've shown you here are so different, but they're all feeling the same things. So this is the raw truth about high school. And this is the stuff we don't necessarily want to remember about what it felt like to be in high school. And the things that we want to pretend like don't really happen anymore or pray that won't happen to our kids when they get there. But it, it did happen and it will happen. And I feel like because I let myself see the things that I hid in my own life and discovered a truth that let me speak to these girls in a way that would ring true. And I feel like that is the thing that made this book so successful. It let me create a piece of art just for them and that they felt like they, you know, understood and that they were understood. And that's why I believe that the truth is the thing that makes that universal so specific and, and resonates so deeply. So, the graveyards that are underneath us all are what makes us empathetic as people. And it will be the thing that makes your art accessible. So I encourage all of you to find a way to be brave and access that deeper inner stuff. And it will make you a better writer or a better artist or a mother or a father or a friend and just a better human. Thank you.